This is part of the Boca Physics series on electromagnetism. In today's lecture, we'll discuss conformal mapping. Conformal mapping falls within the realm of complex analysis. If you're a physics major, it's likely the only time you'll ever hear the term conformal mapping is in a mathematical physics class. Now, the reason why I've included it as part of the, of the electromagnetism series is because it's possible to solve certain kinds of electrostatics problems using the technique of conformal mapping. Basically, um, the whole procedure involves mapping from a more complicated geometry over to a simpler geometry, one for which you can write down the solution immediately or for which there is very little algebra uh, required, and then mapping it back to the system that you actually wanted to solve in the first place. If you look at some of the older textbooks, um, they actually cover conformal mapping more uh, than more recent books. Um, Morrison Feshbach is a really good source um, for conformal mapping. Um, most of the electromagnetism books nowadays don't even mention it. Uh, if you look at SMIDE, which is from way back, uh, they solve um, quite a few problems using the technique of conformal mapping. So anyway, let's begin with some of the basics. As a reminder, complex number. can be written the sum of two parts, a real part A and an imaginary part B. And I is the imaginary number, minus, uh, square root of minus one. Now we're going to be interested in functions of a complex variable. Our complex variable is usually denoted by the letter Z, and that's equal to x plus i, y, again, real part, imaginary part. And I can define a function of that complex variable, function f of z, and that too can be written as a sum of a real part, usually indicated by the lowercase u, and an imaginary part, usually indicated by lowercase v. So what do I mean by the term mapping? my complex Z plane and I can uh, indicate where a point lies in the Z plane. It's just going to be X plus IY. Uh, if you're dealing with circles, however, a more convenient way of expressing complex variables in terms of the modulus R times E of that K, or basically in polar form. Modulus is just square root of x squared plus y squared. And theta is the angle to find any counterclockwise direction up from the positive um, real axis. Okay? Now the question of mapping is, how does an image or shape over in the z plane map over to the so-called w plane? possible shapes possible, straight lines. So we'll say that this is corresponds to y equals 1, y equals 2, y equals minus 1, and y equals minus 2. We'll also throw in some straight lines that are Corresponding to x equals 2, x equals 1, x equals minus 1, and x equals minus 2. So I've got this grid of lines, and the z plane question is what's it look like in the w plane? Well, we have to know what the function is, so let's take the simplest possible function, f of z is equal to z. Well, you can guess what this image is going to look like. It's just going to be the same set of grid lines. So 
so I'm not really drawing you too well. Uh, this line corresponds to y equals 1. This corresponds to y equals 2. And this corresponds to y is equal to minus 1. Y is equal to minus 2. And I really didn't need to draw this last line in here. Just leave that off. And then we have x equals 1 x equals 2, x equals minus 1, and x equals minus 2. Well, that doesn't look like very interesting. So let's take, uh, let's suppose our function is slightly more complicated. Let's suppose that instead of our function being equal to z, let's suppose it's equal to i z. So how does that change things up? Well, if I multiply i by this, we'll wind up with minus y plus ix. And it's useful at this point to pick out points. So we'll pick out four points in this case. We'll pick out um, a, b, c, and d. So I map these four points from the z-plane over to the w-plane. And the effect of multiplying the variable z by i is essentially a rotation. It corresponds to a rotation of 90 degrees. And i squared is equal to minus 1. And that corresponds to a rotation of 180 degrees. i cubed is equal to minus i. And that's a rotation of 270 degrees. And i to 4, which just takes you back to the point where you started. And that's going to be a rotation of 360 so that's another way of looking at uh, complex variables. Um, you can look at them uh, vectorially, basically. Okay? So effective multiplying by i is rotation of 90. i squared is 180 degrees. i cubed is 270 degrees. And i to the fourth is 360 degrees. We've looked at straight lines. What about a circle? And again, I'm going to like these points A, B, C, and D. And this is when our function is equal to i's of z. Well, basically, again, if I multiply by i, this corresponds to rotation. And therefore, this point is A at the top. Uh, B, it lies along the negative real axis. 
C lies on the negative imaginary axis, and D lies on the positive real axis. Okay. function uh, z plus 1 over 2i and see what does the image look like in the w plane. Okay, so um, I map these same four points over the w plane uh, first state the origin, uh, corresponding to x equals 0, y is equal to 0, plug that in, that's just going to be 1 over 2i. So u is going to be 0 because the real part is going to be 0. We'll have an imaginary part that's equal to minus 1 half. Now if I plug in the point b, x is equal to 1, y is equal to 0, that'll be 1 plus 1 over 2i. So there again is no real part there, just an imaginary part. So that's going to be minus 1. And C uh, is 1, 1. So we're going to have both real and imaginary parts this time in the W plane. And that will be equal to, again, minus 1. And then 4, 1 half. And last but not least, uh, we'll take the point D at 0 and 1, so in this case we'll have 1 plus i, so that's going to be equal to 1 half, and that's going to be equal to minus 1 half, okay? And let's take a look um, at what that looks like in the simulation. In this simulation, we see how the grid lines in the z-plane map over to the w-plane when the function is equal to z plus 1 over 2i. Both z and w planes are rendered to the same scale. Suppose that in the z plane, point A is at the origin, B is at x equals 1, y equals 0, C is at x equals 1, y equals 1, and D is at x equals 0, y equals 1. When the grid lines are mapped from the z plane to the w plane, everything is scaled down by a factor of 50%, and the grid lines are rotated by 90 degrees in the clockwise direction, and moreover, the grid lines are shifted downwards by a half. Compare the points A, B, C, and D in the W plane with their counterparts in the Z plane. Now the three functions that we've looked at so far are analytic in the finite region of space. Check out functions Z, IZ, and Z plus 1 over 2i. So these are analytic in the finite region of space. And the kinds of uh, transformations that these functions do, well, this one uh, corresponds to a rotation, specifically a rotation of 90 degrees in a counterclockwise direction. This function uh, has translation. It also has rotation. The i is in the denominator, so actually it's equal to minus i which corresponds to a rotation of 270 degrees in the counterclockwise direction. And then you also have a factor of 2 in the denominator, and that corresponds to a magnification. I actually prefer the term scaling, and this first z is just basically the identity. So what does analyticity mean? Well, analytic functions must satisfy 
two conditions. And the first condition is that the cauchy riemann equations must apply. Again, remember we have some um, analytic function f of z and it can be written in terms of a real part indicated by lowercase u and an imaginary part indicated by lowercase v. cauchy riemann equations tell us that the partial derivative of u with respect to x has to be equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to y. Also, the partial derivative of u with respect to y has to be equal to minus the partial derivative of v with respect to x. Now, this is a necessary condition for analyticity, but it's not sufficient. The second condition that must be satisfied is that the derivative must be continuous. At a particular point, at the point at which um, the function is analytic, okay? So another way of saying it must be continuous is that if I've got some point, um, out here, and no matter which way this point is approached, the derivative has to be the same. So I want to look at an example of a function that actually whose derivatives are not continuous. So let's consider the function such that partial derivative of u with respect to x is equal to x to the fourth plus 3x squared y squared uh, plus 2xy cubed over x squared plus y squared squared. And I'm going to investigate um, the analyticity, or I should say the lack thereof, at the point z equals 0. In other words, uh, x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0. It does make a difference uh, which value approaches 0 first. So let's take a look at limit as um, x goes to 0, but we're going to take the limit y goes to 0 first of this function, partial derivative of u with respect to x. And you can see that in the examples that we looked at. Uh, we were looking at grids uh, corresponding to x equals 1, y, y is equal to 1, and so forth. And that our counterparts, or mapped counterparts, 
all were perpendicular to each other, so their angles were preserved. And that is the case if a function is analytic. Now, if we're just dealing with functions that are analytic everywhere, um, things are going to be all that interesting. So let's take an example of a function that isn't analytic absolutely everywhere. That is to say, let's look at the function equal to 1 over z. And this is inversion. If we are interested in looking at uh, inverting circles, what are their uh, inverted circles look like? Well, it's convenient to write this in uh, uh, polar coordinates. So this is equal to r to the minus 1 e to the minus i theta. We can also write this in terms of uh, rectangular coordinates as well. It might be useful for certain cases. So 1 over z is equal to 1 over x plus i y. And I'm going to get this imaginary um, part out of the denominator. So you can do that by multiplying Uh, the numerator and denominator by um, x minus i y over x minus i y. Essentially, we're just multiplying by one. And in the numerator, that will be x minus i y, and in the denominator, that will be x squared plus y squared. So, writing this as real imaginary parts, this is going to be x over x squared plus y squared minus i y over x squared plus y squared. Let's take a look at how a circle transforms using the function 1 over z. In this simulation, we see how circles in the z-plane map over the w-plane when the function is 1 over z. Once again, both z and w-planes are rendered to the same scale. We'll assume that the outer circle in the z-plane has unit radius and that the inner circle has radius 1 half. The points a, b, c, and d lie on the inner circle and correspond to angles 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees. The orange dot at the center denotes the singularity of the function 1 over z, which is at z equals 0. For the function 1 over z, a circle maps to a circle with the radius, which is the inverse of the radius, in the z-plane. Hence, the unit circle in the z-plane maps to a unit circle in the w-plane, and the circle with radius 1 half in the z-plane maps to a circle with radius 2 in the w-plane. The points a and c in the w-plane lie on the real axis, just like their counterparts in the z-plane. However, the points b and d are swapped. Transforming using the function 1 over z amounts to a reflection with respect to the real axis. Now, it's not surprising, perhaps, that a circle maps over to a circle when you use symbol inversion. Let's take a look at a straight line. And this is a z-plane, and we'll look in particular at the straight line corresponding to y is equal to 1. And I'm going to go ahead and make up a table here. So x is equal to 0, and we'll have d is equal to 1, and e is equal to 
two. And it also, as I said, pick two points way far away. So we'll say that this is very far away, far left, minus um, infinity. We'll call this plus infinity. I'm going to figure out what are the values of u and v. How do these values, how does this line map over to the w plane? So if I uh, take point c here, um, x is equal to 0. So that is just going to be equal to u is going to be equal to 0 in that case. And y is just equal to negative 1. We note that mapping straight lines using the function 1 over z does not result in straight lines in the w plane, but circles. Here, once again, the z and w planes are drawn to the same scale. 
As x gets bigger and bigger in magnitude, 1 over z approaches 0. Essentially, the ends of an infinitely long line bend towards and approach the origin, thereby forming a circle. The point C at x equals 0 and y equals 1 on the imaginary axis maps over to u equals 0, v equals minus 1 on the imaginary axis of the w plane. Likewise, the line y equals minus 1 maps to the upper circle on the w plane. The line x equals 1 maps to the circle on the right side. And the line x equals minus 1 maps to the circle on the left side. The point B lies at the intersection of the lines y equals 1 and x equals minus 1. The point D lies at the intersection of the lines y equals 1 x equals 1. Points B and D in the W plane lie at the intersection of the corresponding circles. A and E in the W plane would each also lie in the intersection of two circles had we also mapped the straight lines x equals 2 and x equals minus 2. So let's make some observations about how lines and circles transform under the function of 1 over z. First thing is that uh, the circle that doesn't pass through the origin maps as a circle. We saw that with some of the simulations. Um, in those cases, the circles were centered about the origin, but this is also the case for circles that are not centered about the origin, just so they don't pass through the origin. That's the important thing. Um, second observation line that doesn't pass through the origin will map as a circle. We've seen this for the particular case of the line y is equal to 1. Its circle, uh, its edge is a circle, and um, circle that passes through the origin will map as a line. Well, we can see this, uh, look at this as a reverse situation. Um, we've got a circle here that passes through the origin, and its image will be a line. The reason why is that there is a singularity at the origin for the function 1 over z. Um, and last but not least, a line that passes through the origin will map as a line. Now, so far, we've only been concerned about the contours themselves, but we are interested in the uh, technique of conformal mapping as it applies to solving um, electrostatic boundary boundary problems. So that means we're, we're interested in the regions of space, not just exclusively the boundaries. I'm going to take a look at some simulations that show you um, how certain regions of space map over under this transformation. The transformation 1 over z on the line y equals 1, which we traverse from left to right, maps a region of space above the line to the interior of the circle in the W plane. Notice the direction of the arrow in the Z plane, which we have chosen, and notice the direction of the arrow in the W plane, which is determined by the mapping function. Next we'll consider the same line rotated 45 degrees in the clockwise direction with respect to the origin. Notice how the circle in the W plane is also rotated 45 degrees with respect to the origin, but in the counterclockwise direction. And we return to the original line, y equals 1. The functions that we've looked at so far i z, z plus 1 over 2i, and the identity function, which I won't bother writing up here. These are all examples of bilinear transformations. So the kinds of operations are rotation, translation, scaling, which a lot of authors refer to as magnification, and inversion. Now, finding your transformation has the general form CZ, or excuse me, 
has a general form AZ plus B over CZ plus D. The thing you want to notice here is that this has a pole at C is equal to minus D over C. And we also want to have the imposed restriction that AD, the product of AD, cannot be equal to BC. And the reason for that is because well, we don't want this to just be a constant function. Okay? Now, those observations we made about how circles, uh, lines and circles transform under 1 over z can be generalized for any bilinear transformation. Basically, a circle that does not pass through a pole maps as a circle. A line that doesn't pass through the pole maps as a circle. A circle that passes through the pole maps as a line. And finally, a line that passes through the pole maps as a line as well. So the bilinear transformation uh, causes the circles and lines to be transformed as lines and circles depending on whether the contour passes through the pole or not. I want to take an example here of how a particular circle transforms and under two different transformation functions. So the contour in question is just going to be a circle. Um, and this is in the, the Z plane. And we'll assume that this has radius 2 and that it's shifted over uh, to the right from the origin by 1. The equation that describes the circle is absolute value of Z minus 1 is equal to 2. For starters, we'll pick out four points, A, B, C, and B. A and C will lie on the real axis. B and D are at the top and bottom of this circle. I'm going to make up a little table here. And the first function that I want to investigate is Z plus I over Z minus I. How does this tra uh, circle transform to the W plane under this transformation function? So what I notice is where's the pole? Poles are equal to, uh, Z is equal to I. And because this circle, which I've sketched out, doesn't pass through this pole, the mapped uh, function, the image, is going to be another circle. Now I could actually do the algebra here and write this out in terms of X and Y, but I'm going to keep things a little bit simpler here. I'm just going to leave this as Z plus I over Z minus I. Point A. lies at 3 along the real axis. Point C lies at negative 1 along the real axis. B is at 1 plus 2i, and D is at 1 minus 2i. And all I need to do is just plug these values of Z into the transformation function to figure out what the uh, where the image points are going to be located. So in the first instance, we'll just do 3 plus i over 3 minus i, and you know, get this complex number out of the denominator. You just want to have a real number down there. So the way you do that is to multiply by the complex conjugate, which in this case is just 3 plus i. So I can multiply by 3 plus i over 3 plus i, just multiplying by 1. Therefore, the denominator is going to be 3 times 3 is 9, and you have minus i times i, which is equal to plus 1, so that's 10, and then the imaginary parts will cancel out. So you've got 10 in the denominator, and the numerator, if you do the math here, this will be 9, and you have i times i, that's just negative 1, so that will be 8. And then for the imaginary part, um, you've got i3 and i3, so that's going to be plus i6, therefore w is equal to um, 4 fifths, plus I three-fifths. And I'll just write down the, uh, the W's for the rest of the, the other three points. Uh, this is going to be equal to 2 plus I. This is equal to minus I. And this is equal to two-fifths 
plus I one fifth. and the W plane won't lie in the same relative position. So you're going to have a circle, but it will not be the case that A is going to be over here, B is up here, C is here, and D is down here. They're actually going to be oriented differently. So let's take a look at the simulation of this circle in the W plane. Now the radius of the circle in the W plane is twice as large as the radius of the circle in the Z plane, and it's centered at the point 2 minus I. In this case, the interior of the circle in the z-plane maps to the exterior of the circle in the w-plane. Relating this to solving electrostatic boundary value problems, this transformation doesn't lead to a simplification. Let's consider a different transformation. Now, let's consider how the same circle described by the absolute value z minus 1 is equal to 2 transforms under a different function. This time, let's take our transformation function b minus i over 2, z minus 3, all over z plus 1. The first thing you want to notice here is that this has a pole at minus 1, and your circle happens to pass through it. So therefore, the image of this function is going to be a straight line. So if you just fill in this point here, this is going to be infinity. Uh, the point corresponding to uh, z equals 3a, just plug that in, that's going to be equal to 0. And I won't bother working it out, but uh, you can do the math yourself. You can plug in 1 plus 2i into this function and you'll wind up with 1 half and minus 1 half, which is just a real line more than that. It's a real line that lies along the real axis. Uh, so let's take a look at the simulation of that. Using the transformation minus i times z minus 3 all over 2z plus 2 causes the circle to be mapped to the real axis in the w plane. Because the circle passes through the pole at z equals minus 1, the map contour is unbounded, that is to say a straight line. The yellow point therefore maps to infinity, and the interior of the circle is mapped to the entire upper plane. I'm going to close out today's lecture with uh, solving an electrostatic boundary value problem. And the problem in question is that of a very long cylinder and we'll assume that it has a unit radius and place it at the origin. We'll assume that the upper half is grounded and the lower half is at potential V0. And I want to determine what is the potential in the interior region. Now, if you watched any of the uh, earlier Boca physics videos, you probably watched one of them where we were solving basically two dimensional problems um, in cylindrical coordinates. and. Um, I think we have one where we had V0 and minus V0. What's the potential inside? So if you went through that, you know that uh, we use separation of variables to solve Laplace's equation. And there was an awful lot of algebra involved. What you'll see using the technique of conformal mapping is that the algebra is really very minimal. Um, the one thing that I haven't gotten to yet, but I'm just going to assert, is that if I can find a function that's analytic, that um, satisfies the proper boundary conditions, that is the correct, unique solution, okay? I'm not going to prove that rigorously today, I'm just going to solve this problem. So the question is, I want to map this more complicated structure over to a simpler geometry in the W plane. And it would be nice if I could map this over to a straight line and uh, preferably a straight line that happens to lie along the real axis. So as it turns out, transformation function that accomplishes that is equal to minus i, z minus 1, over z plus 1. Now, to solve the problems, it really boils down to determining the 
correct transformation function. You might be question, asking yourself right now, well, gee, um, how do I know what transformation function to use? Or I just make a wild guess. Well, as it turns out, there actually is a procedure for finding a transformation function that maps a certain um, geometry over to the geometry that you want to have. Anyway, uh, this function will map over to a straight line. So this contour we're taking a counterclockwise direction, that will map over to the real axis in the W plane. Now let's look at a simulation. If the circle is centered at the origin, then the transformation function minus i times z minus 1 over z plus 1 will map the circle over to a straight line which lies along the real axis in the W plane. Okay, so this positive real axis corresponds to the upper circle. So this is going to be grounded. And the lower half of the circle maps over to the negative real axis. This is going to be equal to V naught. So the problem is that I map this more complicated system or more complicated geometry into your solution to the upper half plane of, um, of the W plane. We need to find an um, analytic function that satisfies these boundary conditions. So it turns out I can just write this down right away. Um, the phase, if I have uh, W, the phase of that is equal to zero along the positive real axis, and pi along the negative real axis. So therefore, the function in the W plane that satisfies these values conditions is going to be the V naught over pi times the argument of W. Now, if you've never taken a class on complex analysis or you didn't really delve into complex analysis in much detail in your physics class, you might not be familiar with um, arguments. So uh, I'll just tell you that that's equal to the phase. So the phase of W is just equal to zero in the um, positive real axis. You go pi over two, positive imaginary axis, and pi on the negative real axis. Okay? So there's your solution. But I want to know what the solution is inside the circle, uh, essentially inside the very long cylinder over here. So how do I do that? We'll just map in what W is equal to. And that's equal to V naught over pi, argument of minus i, z minus 1, over z plus 1. And as it turns out, if you've got the argument of the product of two uh, variables or functions. You can just equal to argument of z1 plus argument of z2. So I'm just going to use that to pull the argument of i out by itself. And then we'll be left with argument of minus z minus 1 over z plus 1. Now, I want to actually get an expression in terms of x and 1, so I'm going to go ahead and do some algebra here. Uh, z minus 1 over z plus 1 is equal to x plus i y. Minus 1 over x plus i y plus 1. And then I want to collect together the real and imaginary parts, so I'm just going to rearrange these terms. I 
question about that minus sign up front. So let's do the minus sign here, minus sign here, and a minus sign over here. Okay. So minus z minus one over z plus one is going to equal to minus x squared plus y squared minus one plus i two y all over x plus one squared plus y squared. Now, how do you determine uh, the argument? How do you determine the phase of that? Well, remember if you have any point. plotted on some complex plane, um, you write it in polar coordinates, this is the angle theta, this is the modulus. But you can determine this angle if you know how far in the real and how far in the imaginary. So basically it's just a trigonometry problem, it's just going to be the inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part. So therefore that's equal to the inverse tangent of the imaginary part which is minus 2y over the real part, which is 1 minus x squared minus y squared. Remember, we've got this minus sign out front. So it's the inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part. So I'll plug all this back in up here, and I'll find that my function The one that is the solution of the interior region, grabbed under the upper um, upper circle or semicircle, and at b naught on the lower semicircle is equal to b naught over pi. Well, the argument of i was not equal to all well, i is just a unit along the imaginary axis. So it's just a little pi over two, and this is equal to plus inverse tangent of minus 2y over 1 minus x squared minus y squared. And there's your solution. So as you can see, there's a lot less algebra involved using the technique of conformal mapping to solve for the interior solution than there is if you use the separation of variables to solve Laplace's equation. Now let me see, check and make sure that this has the proper value on the boundary. If you consider the upper part, um, basically this is going to be inverse tangent of an infinity. If you imagine this gets, if you take a point that gets closer and closer over here, uh, this is going to go to infinity. But for a positive y, that's going to be negative. So it's going to be, uh, you're going to want to pi over 2 plus essentially minus pi over 2. So that's going to be equal to 0. Now if we take the lower half plane, uh, y is negative there. So again, that's going to get, uh, you should get on the circle very close to the circle. That's going to go to infinity. And you know, ta inverse tangent of infinity is going to be either pi over 2 or minus pi over 2. In this case, uh, y is negative. So therefore, that's going to be equal to, um, you're going to wind up with uh, pi over 2 as your answer there. So that's pi over 2 plus pi over 2 is equal to pi. That will cancel out with pi, and that will give you be naught. Now how about a long the mid-plane. You would expect the uh, potential to be half the value between the upper half and the lower half, or v naught over 2. Well, in that case, along uh, the x-axis, y is equal to 0. Inverse tangent of 0 is just 0, so you have v naught over 2 exactly as expected. So again, that's how you solve uh, electrostatic boundary value problem using the technique of conformal mapping. Now, there are many other ways to map functions or uh, geometries over from the z plane over the w plane. We've just looked at bilinear transformations. Uh, there, you can use a natural log to map. And there's also a technique called the schwartz christoffel transformation. And that's used to map polygons over to the real axis. So uh, we barely scratched the surface here, and uh, we'll look at more electrostatic boundary value problems in an upcoming video. And we'll also look at how do you figure out what the transformation function should be uh, in order to, that it has the right, um, it's located in the right uh, region of space. Okay? So anyway, that concludes the first part of conformal mapping.